Tell stories or do stories tell us? That was a question I found myself asking a few years ago. This happened because of a chance phone call. It was late one Saturday morning. I was sitting in my apartment, taking the last sips of morning coffee, putting off going to the gym as one is wont to do on a lazy Saturday, when my cell phone rang. Buongiorno, cugina. Ah, my cousin John. I immediately recognized his Midwestern twang and exaggerated Italian accent. We are a family of Italian Americans who don't know how to speak Italian. My cousin was calling to ask me for some travel advice. He was trying to get to Milan and his connecting flight had been canceled. So he called me trying to navigate the twin airports of New York City where I live in order to catch another connecting flight to get to his original evening one. My cousin had been planning a month-long solo bike ride through Italy, and he didn't want to miss a single moment. He was born in Italy, perhaps the reason for that magnetic pull to the motherland. During the course of the conversation, as I was looking at traffic patterns, seeing if he could make both flights in time, he made an offhand comment. He told me that he had recently joined an adoption group for people like him. Children who were born in Italy and adopted by American parents through a Catholic Church program. My cousin came to America in April of 1959. He was nine months old. He explained, I spoke to the guy who runs this adoption group and he told me some amazing information. He even knew the flight that I came in on as a baby. My cousin is an enthusiast, so he spoke fast because he was pressed for time. And then he began telling me stories, stories he'd been hearing talking to other adoptees in this group, stories about birth mothers, stories about children, stories that disturbed me. And I began to realize that this phone call was turning into something different than I had previously imagined. And then he blurted out, can you believe it? My birth mother could be alive and not even know that I exist. What? My cousin had been told that some birth mothers, to smooth the adoption process, were told their babies had died. Now I began to wonder, was this internet gossip or pieces of a larger puzzle that needed to be solved? Hey, I gotta go, my cousin said, I gotta catch my flight. And I said, wait, wait, surprised by the force of my voice and my rising adrenaline. I said, wait, can you put me in touch with the man who runs this adoption group? My cousin promised that he would. He made his flight, began his solo month-long bike ride through Italy, and he connected me with an extraordinary man named John Campitelli, who I'm delighted to say is here in this audience today, who runs this adoption group. John was born in Torino in 1963 and came to America, adopted by American parents in 1965. And after talking to John and listening to his story and also of his three siblings, the four Campitelli children were all adopted through the same Revotrofio, the Institution for Children of Unwed Mothers in Torin. I began to realize that I had to pursue this further because John was telling me stories about birth mothers that took my breath away. And one literally made me gasp. And that happened right here in Bergamo. But I'll get back to that later. For me, the heart of the story that I wanted to tell was the treatment of unwed mothers that began post-war around 1950 and stretched all the way into the 1970s. I wanted, no, no, I needed to tell this story because for me, it illustrated the silence bound to the experience of being a woman. That when we do talk, often no one listens or we're afraid to say what happened to us for fear it will bring us further shame or harm. And so I realized that in order to proceed, I needed to clear my head of all the stories that had been told about these women. And I did that by asking myself a series of questions. Do we tell stories or do stories often tell us? 
tell us to love or to hate, to see or to be blind, as the American essayist Rebecca Solomon has written. Solomon suggests that in order to be truly free, we need to question the stories we are told. We need to hear them, but we also need to pause, to hear the silence, to name them, and then to become a storyteller. And then I asked, when something is right in front of our eyes, why do we choose not to see it? And when people say, well, that's just the way things are, that's just the way things were, why don't we ever challenge those words? <sighs> Breathe deep, I told myself. There's a story to tell. And indeed, during that time period, tens of thousands of women were surrendering their children to Brevetrofio throughout Italy. Over 3,700 came to the United States for adoption. It was estimated that by the late 1950s, over 200,000 of these children were in need of public assistance. A friend of mine, born in Mantova in 1963, told me that his grandmother once said that when he was growing up, his mother had a recurrent nightmare, that my friend and his brother would be taken from her and sent to a brevetrophia. Now I said to my friend, well, that's crazy. You were raised in a proper Italian home. Why would your mother have this fear? She had seen news clips, my friend said, of the crowd of brevetrophy. And indeed, with so many children and so few staff, sometimes bottles had to be wrapped in a napkin, placed level with the infant's head, in order for the infant to feed him or herself. Until the children could walk, they couldn't leave the institution. They couldn't feel the tingle of cold air on their skin, run their hands or feet through soft blades of grass. Rather, they were made to sit in chairs, sometimes for hours. I spoke with a birth mother. She lived in a Brevetrophy in Milan for three months. She told me that the women were given striped smocks to wear and a white kufia in which to tuck their hair. They lived on one floor, the children lived below. Awoken early in the morning around 5.30, 6 o'clock, where they came down to nurse their children. Just that once, and then they were off to clean the institution. It was not an accident, it was a design to separate birth mothers to separate children from the stain of their birth mother's sin. I can imagine the nightmare of my friend's mother to be a mother no longer, any woman's nightmare. You see, back then, people didn't say very nice things about these women. A woman who ran a home for unwed mothers in Rome, she called them frivolous and irresponsible. It's easy to call a woman frivolous and irresponsible, isn't it? Placing all the blame on her. Nobody ever used words like trapped by religion, family, and social code. Nobody ever talked about how frightened these women were, alone in the world, because the men ran off as soon as the problems happened, and their families wanted nothing to do with them. What would the neighbors think? Nobody ever said the word rape. And no one ever talked about how unwed mothers were lied to, given forms to sign that they didn't understand. Some would actually go to the Brevetrofio to ask for their children back, told they were already sent to the United States, when in fact, they remained in these institutions for years until the adoption paperwork was put into place. But of all the stories that I heard, of all the lies told, one to me was unimaginable. And that happened right here in Bergamo. The story of a teenage mother, naive, didn't even know she was pregnant, had some health issues, they were running some blood tests and found this out. They immediately whisked her to a home for unwanted mothers where she waited out her labor. She couldn't see her parents, she couldn't see her siblings. And she was told shortly after the birth that her baby did not make it. She was then sent to another home for one young woman like her to learn a trade. But no mother, no matter how young or advanced in childbearing years, no mother ever wants to hear that her baby has died. So she asked questions, so did other young women. So one day, the nuns took the three of them, this woman and two others, to the cemetery in Bergamo. There was a separate section for children. Some graves were elaborate, others were mounds of dirt. And they brought her to a mound of dirt with a cross bearing her child's name, where she returned to mourn her infant. About a decade ago, a court in Florence granted an adopted daughter 
the right to finally meet her birth mother. She was about to turn 60 years old. And on that day, that daughter took a train from Florence to Bergamo to meet the woman who was told all those years ago that her daughter had died. And on that day, she was able to tell her mother that she not only was a daughter, but a wife and a mother and a grandmother. And on that day, this woman so traumatized by what had happened to her that she never married or had another child, became a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. Now, some of you may say, why tell these stories? Why stir up all this unpleasantness? Why am I summoning the storm cloud on a now sunny day? After all, as I said, these things happened years ago. Life is different now. Well, women's choicelessness and voicelessness, they are never-ending stories. It's a tired script, and unless we keep rewriting it, these ideas will keep surfacing again. Women's rights are being trampled around the world. The United States is leading the way on this front, and Europe equally needs to protect these rights. And if we're going to go back to shaming women, well, today it'll be only one social media click away. Over the course of the past few years, I heard many stories of birth mothers and of their children. I listened, but I also paused. I heard the silence, and then I tried to retell them. You see, a chance phone call opened up my life. I began to think more about the values in which I was raised. I'm the granddaughter of Contadini from southern Italy, Avellino and Basilicata. And I thought about growing up, the tremendous shame that was always attached to the female body. I thought about how in much of America during those days, you couldn't even say the word pregnant, considered inappropriate. And I thought about how women have always been held responsible for an act that requires two people, and how the rich could always choose how they wanted to live, while the rest had to follow a strict moral code. And I thought about how these patterns continue and they threaten women's freedoms today. You see, we tell stories because we learn how to live from them, because the past lives in the present, because we want a say in shaping our future, and because silence is not an option. So I ask all of you, think about the stories you've been told. Perhaps there's a family secret that needs to be reimagined. Perhaps you know a woman who's had to bury her pain to conform to a larger social code. And if you have ever heard of those institutions known as a brevetrofio, I ask you to consider the ugly truths that took place inside those walls. For those women have been silenced by history, and they could have been our mothers or our grandmothers or our great-grandmothers, and they deserve our compassion and our respect. But most of all, I ask you, whatever you do, don't let the story tell you. Breathe deep. There's your story to tell. Thank you.